So Paul, having worked on multiple Alice in Chains records and Jerry Cantrell's most recent solo album, Brighton, in your opinion, is there anything unique about the way Jerry approaches playing guitar? Yeah, he gets weird. <laughs> he make, he keeps it simple and gets weird. So, you know, it's like, you know, all the, the wet, bendy, creepy notes, that's what he calls it. He's really good at it. And, and it's, I think, yeah, I think he was telling us a story after Black is Weighted Blue came out and everyone's like, damn it, Jerry, how'd you do that? You know, like that riff is this, it's like, it's so simple, but it's genius at the same time because it just it, it just pulls an emotion out of you and you just, you know, you want to hear it. Sexy win. Yeah, for sure. So how does Jerry record his guitar parts? Early on, so on Black Eyes Way to Blue, you know, he's doubling his parts and he's got some bendy notes and, and uh, you know, gu you know higher guitar lines. And he's like, hey, I don't want to hear the double. I just need to hear this guitar. And I'm like, whoa, okay. And he does it and it's perfect it's like he without hearing the other one he's just playing to the drums or the click track in a spot and he's playing the exact thing twice or three times and when you layer them or you stack them it's like one big giant guitar hand and it's pretty impressive you know so when we track when nick and i track it's like all right we have we, we set jerry up with the guitar and he lays down a scratch guitar and then sean goes out there and and he locks to that so we don't have to worry about everybody trying to mess up or, you know, this was just to streamline the operation. You know, we do all the drums first and we then we jump into guitars. Then we'll jump onto bass. Like, Cause sometimes if a bass is pulling just a little bit and this is important and I get it, it can pull sharp or, you know, if they slide back and grab a note that you're pulling flat. You want to make, guitars are a little bit easier to hear if they're out of tune. Cause you have six strings and if they're out, one's out of tune, you hear, you hear it rub really quick. But bass, it's really hard to tell when you just have drums and bass if something's pulling a little sharp or not. So now you start stacking guitars on there and, you know, something just doesn't feel right. This is, it's not wrong. We, we need to recut that. Are you in tune? And it's like, yeah, I'm in tune. So that's why we do bass after all the guitars. You know, all of a sudden now we're in guitar mode and, you know, it's like, all right, what's first? Whatever Jerry feels like doing. So, you know, but, but back then he was smoking uh, cigarettes a lot. You know, I remember him just blowing, it was just blowing smoke into the back of my head. You know, I'm at the console and there's a set, there's an ashtray on the console next to the faders. And, you know, it was just, you know, I got to shower every night when I got home. It was pretty brutal. Yeah. Now he's, now he's, you know, now he chews the, you know, the Nicorette and it smells better. <laughs> yeah. He decided that his voice sounded better without the cigarette smoke on there. So, you know, it, he, he quit and got on the, the Nicorette and, uh, you know, so he still gets his nicotine and, you know, he gets to feel good. <laughs> That's awesome. So how did Jerry approach recording vocals? It's like his guitars. It's he hears it and he knows where he wants to go. And he's he really takes the time to, to like iron out what it's going to be before he sings it. it he just is, you know, oh, I think I got a spot a, a part for that. It's he, it's all in his head already. And he's trying to get there. So just being patient making sure he warms up. He's one of these singers, you know, I, I worked with Evanescence and she can sing all day long, like, and her voice sounds amazing. Like she's, you know, her voice is a tank. And, uh, you know, I can't run Jerry like that. I gotta, hey, work for five, 10 minutes, give him a break, let his voice calm down, make sure he's got tea. Otherwise, if I run him too hard, you know, or any singer, some singers, you know, this is, he just happens to be this type of singer, the high end disappears. And then the quality of voice is different. So I want consistency. So I want him to sound fresh. We're capturing this thing for, for everyone to hear from then on out. So I have to pay particular attention to, uh, you know, how his voice is sounding, not just pitch, but like the actual quality of voice. Hmm. So in that case, I'm curious, since you mentioned now that you prefer him going for short intervals of vocals in the studio, how does he approach vocals live? Well, so live, he's only singing for, you know, how long is the set? An hour and a half? You know, so he's singing for an hour and a half. But when we work, we're going to work all day or, you know, most of the day. I'm going to work for three or four hours or, you know, hey, we're going to work for 10 minutes here. I'm going to I'm going to comp and do things over here. Come back in a half hour. It, yeah, I've got to really space it out. You know, it's important because you don't want to destroy his voice. I remember at the end of Black Is Way to Blue, you know, he got laryngitis and he just couldn't sing. So we had, you know, we wrapped up and we came back after his voice came back and we had to go back in and sing. But, you know, it's like uh, vocalists are, are gentle creatures. And, you know, so live, you know, you play a show, you rest, 
And, you know, I, I don't know if you've seen Will after his shows, and he, another ripping singer, and he, he wears a scarf because he wants to keep his voice, you know, for the next day. And he tries, you know, tries not to talk too much, which, you know, Jerry does too, I'm sure. Hmm. So, you know, Jerry has a great voice, and I know you didn't get to work with him, but how would you compare Jerry's voice to Lane's? Ooh, you know, I've I've never heard Lane's voice soloed out, but Jerry's got like a mid-range, he's got like a, it, it it seems soft or sandy, if that makes sense, but there's a lot of weight to it and power. I think Lane, his range was just, and he could con- control it, get low and growly, and and hit it way up there too, and you know have total control. Um, you know, I, I think Jerry early on was like, ah, I'm just not that good of a singer, but he he's you're right, he's a great singer, and he's a great songwriter too. Oh, for sure. So in terms of Jerry's songwriting, how exactly did the COVID lockdown impact the making of Brighton? Alice in Chains released Rainier Fog in 2018. Brighton came out more than three years later, but from what I understand, there wasn't meant to be that much of a gap. So what exactly happened there? Before COVID, this record was supposed to be done like May 2020, like done. You know, COVID just put a wrench into that whole thing. We started right after Rainier, his, the end of the Rainier Fog tour cycle. And he came home and he was like, dude, it's time. I'm going to start my, my solo record. I'm like, great. And he's like, we're going to start demoing now. I'm like, all right, great. So we just started diving in. And then he put this band together to do a show. Like he had booked a show and he hadn't even like <laughs> put these musicians together. So uh, it was just, it was kind of a fun, weird time because we're scrambling to do demos and then he's scrambling to like put a band together and like start rehearsing and do the show you know it's always fun with jerry just watching him create being there turning invisible and just letting him get lost on his fretboard so these things can you know materialize and that's what it happened that's what happened again so this started in like september the show was in december then january we kind of dove in deep and did some lots of pre-pro and then by march the band was ready to track We did four days of drums at uh, the studio called Igloo. Then we went to my place, Dave's room. And, uh, you know, I'd already had to think this thing out because I've got four days here and I've got 10 days at my my space. I was already like mapping in my head what the layout in the studio was going to be because we had, at that point, we had, I think there was like 14 or 15 songs we needed to track. So 10 days, that's, you know, 10 days of guitars with Jerry usually is, you know, only a handful of songs, it, it, you know, like for Alice. But for this, it was, you know, we were on a really tight schedule and, you know, there's layers and layers and layers of guitars. So uh, just staying on top of that. So that part was exciting. And then the news broke that, hey, there's COVID. And that's kind of like floating in the back of our head. And we're like, well, you know, all we're doing is going home to sleep, coming right back to the studio the next day and working. And it's just me, him, Herb, his guitar tech, and my, my assistant engineer. So, you know, we all just kind of were our own little bubble. But, you know, they had the shutdown, I think it was like on the 18th. And we actually loaded up and got out of there on the 21st. So it was March of 2020. So that was the the serious lockdown. We had to close our studio. And uh, we were able to do a couple of remote things. But, you know, they were like, keep your doors locked. Otherwise, we're going to get a fine. And that was, you know, that was a tough, tough spot for any studio. You know, you, you, you put all your energy to do a record and that's the, your sole focus and you do it. And all of a sudden now it's like things are getting drawn out and there's 10 days or three weeks or a month goes by and you're not touching anything and we're not working. We're just waiting. That was, that was the draining part was, you know, especially with an artist and you've got, uh, you know, the wind taken out of your sails because, you know, he can't book tours. He can't look towards that summer or that winter or that next spring to even begin touring because everything's shut down and you know venues aren't booking anything there were studios all over town that were just you know some didn't make it you know and you know others did but you know there was you know rumors of other studios you know police had to show up and hey this isn't cool this is a lockdown you can't be open type of thing but uh you know luck somehow some way we 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 you know pulled through there so it was like two and a half months and you know that june 1st when we were actually able to open up with covid protocol you know we were booked so and then it just we've been booked since well that's great to hear that your studio was able to bounce back from that lockdown so 
What were you guys able to do for Jerry's record during that period you were in lockdown? So, so after the, after we shut down, we did all the guitars, like a majority of the guitars were done. So now we, you know, decided to set up at Jerry's house, like I did for the end of Rainier Fog recording. Uh, we did, he had a hand, like a bunch of vocals to finish and he got sick right towards the end of that record. And so he couldn't do it with Nick out in Nashville. So I, you know, got a setup and, you know, had him, you know, wired up and headphones and the whole thing. And, you know, we did, we did that. So uh, now we've got a little bit more of a permanent situation at his house, but I had to situate his room, his music room to where he's not singing into the back of my head, you know, cause the mic, you know, I'm up against the wall and the monitors are pointing that way. So I had to, you know, put it against the wall here so he can sing into the, there's like, you know, room treatment and baffles. So that was, it, you know, it worked out. So we did that and then everyone got, you know, turned into hypochondriacs. It's like, my, my throat feels funny. I, 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 you know, I don't feel good. You know, so it's like, Hey, let's take, let's take a few days off or 10 days off. And if, we have symptoms, we'll let the other person know. And, you know, so that went on pretty much all summer long. And, uh, you know, then, then then we kind of wrapped it up and dove into mix mode that next February. But, you know, the rewarding part was, you know, finally, hey, this is it. We're going to pick these nine songs for the record. This is going to, you know, we worked on the sequence and I was like, wow, this is exciting, cool. And, and boom, Barisi's going to mix it. We're going to wrap this thing up. And, and it turned out great. And Jerry was super stoked and Joe's stoked. And it was just, you know, all parties involved. You know, and it's not a COVID record. This rock, all the music was written and recorded before COVID. So it just happened to be wrapped up during COVID. It was just like, hey, we'll do a day here. We'll do a day there. We'll do three days here. We'll do a day there. And, you know, meantime, it's like Jerry finished all of his vocals, all of his extra guitar solos, or he would come, like he would, you know, I'd be on my way over and he's like, Hey Fig, I got an idea. It's like, I, I got another harmony for Brighton or one of the songs. And I'm like, okay, well, the mics are still set up. So we go in. That's better. All right. That's cool. Badass. Make a new rough mix. It's in the box and he can deal with that thing. Then Greg showed up and, uh, you know, then Duff and, you know, so it was just, you know, <laughs> it was fun. He just shows up. All right. You ready to go? All right. Are you recording? And then, you know, it's like, you get like, you get a take out of him and then, then he hones in on a spot and you might get like one more take, but that's it. <laughs> hmm. Was that your first time working with Duff? No, I've worked with him before on other some other little projects, but uh, it was just fun watching him play bass. Because before it was just like, you know, hey, I need demos, demo drums for these things. And I, you know, got a drummer and, you know, got set up my other little work production space. And, uh, you know, he hanging out and he's like throwing down some guitars and, He's, you know, he's pretty quick. He's, he's on a schedule. He's got things to do. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. So what was it like working with Duff on this particular record? Well, he just came in, you know, so Jerry demoed out all the demo, all the bass. And, you know, Duff was like, dude, these are great. It's like, what do you need me for? And, you know, Jerry's like, well, dude, I'm not a bass player. So I just kind of let those two tackle each other. But I, you know, it, and and I, I would chime in every now and again. But Duff would, you know, just like, you know, all right, well, get me to that one spot. And it's like, you know, he needed to hone in on this thing. And then he's like, all right, I got to go. So I just had to make sure I was always rolling and never just like, oh, I'll get another one. No, just always roll, always keep everything, never erase. And, uh, you know, and that's how I did it. And then, you know, of course, it's like, oh, I need I need that little spot right there. I didn't, I only have one of them. And then, you know, I have to go hunting around the, the session and find, oh, there we go. Psh, patch that guy in. But uh, he's, you know, he's just, He's a fun guy, just, you know, lots of energy, just comes in and, you know, lays it down. That's awesome. So in general, what do you think of Duff as a bass player? He was is such a surprisingly great bass player. I never really honed in on, like, what he was doing. I mean, like, back when Appetite came out, I was, you know, I was a little metalhead, and it's like, wow, this is a cool thing. It's kind of, it's rock, but it's, it's punk at the same time, and it, there's something super cool about this band, and you know, there was the whole LA thing, like you know, the end of the strip era right then, and or actually, it was kind of exploding. It was like transforming because Jane's Addiction was already happening. But uh, yeah, when he came in, and he was just going off, and his timing and the, his choice of notes and phrases, and how he just 
you know, I work with Mike Inez too, and he's amazing. It's like, you know, he just glues himself to the kick drum, and you, it, it's like the guy's impossible to shake. And Duff just comes in like he doesn't know, what, you know, oh, hey, yeah, I listened to it for a, a little bit earlier today, and he just comes in and throws it down. And you're like, okay, that's, that's pretty legit. Yeah, for sure. So what's your relationship like with Jerry? Oh, great. I mean, like, we're, you know, I'm a guitar player too, and I just, you know, it's like when somebody's trying to hone in on, you know, a part, not to interject, just let them do their thing. I'm recording it, so I can always get back. Mutual respect, I think. He sees what I do, and, you know, he doesn't, he's not a whiz at Pro Tools or, you know, giant consoles and, you know, getting sounds. Like, Dirt was the high watermark, I thought, for guitar tone for him. And so that was, you know, that was a thing to beat or at least equal in the studio for Black Is Way to Blue and uh, and the rest of the records. You know, I, I think he appreciates the hard work that went into that. And, you know, it's like we get along. It's like I'm not trying to, you know, push him around or anything. I want him, you know, just drown himself in himself so that he can hear his own voice and pull it out of the guitar or his vocal. And I think that's the most important part. Mm -hmm. So how did your relationship with Alice in Chains begin? Well, that happened back in 2008 with, uh, well, Nick Raskulanix gave me a call. I was on vacation, in between gigs, vacation. And he gives me a call and uh, he's like, dude, how do you feel about, you know, like working with Alice in Chains? And I was like, absolutely. And, you know, so uh, he had already met them, listened to the demos and, you know, of course, and he tells me the story how he heard, you know, check my brain and he was like, I'm in. <laughs> yeah, no, and, and when I first heard it, I was like, man, is the floor moving out from under me? This is such a wild tune, and, you know, because the, the bass is bending, the guitar is bending, and, you know, we're cranking it at the studio, and it was just, yeah, it was such a cool opportunity, but, you know, those guys were, you know, freshly sober, and Jerry was a pretty surly guy, and, you know, Mike and Ed is super happy, and, you know, Will was brand new, and Sean is just always funny, and, you know, that that was how that happened. And, you know, we, we all hit it off and we did a great record and, uh, you know, repeat performance two more times. Actually, this is my fourth record with Jerry. Hmm. So what's your favorite Alice record, both in terms of the stuff with Lane and the stuff you worked on? I would have to say, well, Sap and Dirt, it's when I got turned on to them. And I was working at Zia Records when Dirt came out and, you know, we would crank it in this, in the, in this shop and everyone would flinch as soon as that first song came on and, it was always hilarious. And then the new stuff, I mean, they're all great to me. It, it's kind of hard. It's like, you know, hey, which kid do you like better? You know, it's it, it's tough because Black Is Way to Blue has so many great songs on it. And then Devil Put Dinosaurs Here, you know, when he came up with that song, that was amazing. I was like, wow. I'm like, this is cool. And then, you know, Voices, he was just walking around the studio while Sean was on a rampage telling us some stories. And uh, I just... Noticed he was strumming, so I hit play and record, and then he came in later. And he's like, man, I forgot this turnaround. Did you catch any of that? And I'm like, hit stop, and I wound about a couple of minutes. I'm like, this? And he was like, fuck yeah. So, you know, just, you know, you got, you, there's no really relaxing in the studio. You're always working. So, but, uh, and that's the job of an engineer, you know, when you're in a recording studio, you document everything. Just record everything. So, Paul, you were involved with the Alice in Chains Mopop tribute back in 2020. What was that experience like for you? It was super professional. It was such a massive setup. It was insane. But, you know, I got to meet Jeff Ott from London Bridge, which was super cool. Are you, were you up there? Yeah, I did an interview there once. Yeah. And so uh, we hit it off and he had brought like a rack of amazing gear so we could record with because I was, you know, I was hired to oversee the recording of this thing. And, you know, we had a redundant, you know, feed off their monitor desk, which wasn't great mic pre's and we had our feed of great mic pre's you know going into a pro tools rig so i was super lucky and and that thing you know after hearing you know and i love the record the allison chains unplugged i told management and jerry i'm like i'm putting a microphone on your acoustic guitars i don't want to hear that i don't really want to hear the di guitar <laughs> especially for this it's like let's 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 make it nice and so uh you know so we did and it, and it turned out great at least i do i, I think you know, it's like I'm watching them do the recording and I'm like, that's why these guys are so great. They haven't seen each other in like months and they sit down and after a couple of takes, it's like, all right, that's the one. You know, they haven't, they haven't played or sang together and they just, you know, they're all sitting like, you know, 20 feet apart in this giant room and, you know, Sean's hitting his drums like he wants to murder them and it's like kind of getting into every vocal mic and guitar mics like extra room mics, but it, it kind of made for a cool, you know, cool recording. It was fun. 
You mentioned now that you were blown away by how good the band was, even though they hadn't seen each other in months. In general, over the years you've worked with Alice in Chains, have you ever had any moments where you kind of couldn't believe what was happening? Yeah, no, absolutely. Like, like the first one, you know, it's like that was like, well, shoot, man, we want to work with this guy again. We got to really do, we really got to nail this. And and I remember, I remember going to bed after some of the sessions. I'm like, man, it's like, I'm recording Jerry Cantrell's guitars. It's like, who the fuck am I? And, uh, and I was just like, calm down. It's like, he loves the guitar sound. And as long as it's like, is he, as long as he's stoked and, and he, you know, he can, he feels it under his fingers on the fretboard. It's like, and it's great in his, you know, rhythm hand. I think I, we're doing our job. And, you know, if it wasn't, we wouldn't be working. He'd find Brendan O'Brien or, you know, Toby Wright or somebody else. And, you know, they all, you know, they all do great work too. What is the most rewarding part of your job? You know, when, when the artist is stoked to, to listen back, it's like, fuck yeah, that, that's it. Like that's, that's the reward. And, you know, I, I still love recording rock bands and, you know, someone will tell you rock is dead. You know, you look at the Grammy list and it's like, well, not really because those people are competing for something else. These guys and Jerry and the, his, the band, they're, they're on their own trip and they don't care. And it's all about what they want to do, and their fans appreciate that. And they always pack they always pack the shows. So when that stops, I guess they'll figure out something else. But, uh, you know, that's, that's my reward, is being there to facilitate their thing and make their idea and dream or vision, like, the reality. And, and that's it. You know, I don't want to, hey, I got to put my Paul Fig twist on this. My job is to make them, or whoever I'm working with, be the best version of them they can be. And if maybe I might freshen up some spots, but it's not it's not about me. It's about them. How do you feel about it when the producers sometimes take control of the band instead of working with them? Like a lot of times labels will hire the same producer for multiple artists specifically to make them all sound somewhat similar to each other. You know, it's kind of like, you know, when you know, the labels, you know, back back in the day too, it's like, you know, hey, you know, kind of like how when I was at Sound City and that kind of brought the studio back to life when Nirvana exploded. Well, hey, where was that recorded? We need to, you know, light might strike there again. And so they bring the same people that had previous hits or if they are really talented, and I'm sure they are. It's like, you know, it that takes talent to do those things and to have an ear for it and, you know, to be able to like, you know, grab, hey, I like I like these bits from these three guys and I like those four bits from those four guys and I can just, you know, slide them all together and do this thing and then create this thing. And it's like, all right, cool. But, uh, that's not for me. <laughs> <laughs> so for a new producer or engineer, what advice would you give? Just trying to, like, not trying to be relevant or chase what what everybody's doing. Because, I mean, I don't know about you, but I don't want to hear any more, like, goofy hi-hats, like, programmed hats. And, uh, and, 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 like, you know, all these, like, little cartoon sounds and, you know, everything just being, like, uber compressed and in your face. And, it, you know, I like... Hey, have you just heard like an acoustic guitar? It's like, hey, all this modern production, you got things crawling out of every little corner of the speaker and in between and, and you know, this big bass thing. And it's like, hey, that's cool and fun. But after a while, how are you connecting here, you know, with the lyrics or the, or, or what the musician's trying to, you know, emotions that the musician's trying to push across? Not just the lyrics, but like actual music. I think the labels are like, Hey, the closer to pop, the better, because the kids are loving it right now. But it's like, you know, I grew up with pop music. It's like, I knew, I mean, it's so weird. It's like, I don't own any Michael Jackson records, but if somebody plays the best of Michael Jackson, I know every single one of those songs, you know, and I know a lot of Stevie Wonder and, you know, whatever was on the radio at the, at the time. But now, I mean, I can't listen to that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know what you mean. I mean, there are definitely some songs out there today that I like, and I think the electronic production on them is good, but it is oversaturated. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't know if you've looked at the Grammy nominations and like, you know, like, you know, for whatever song or whatever artist and like the list of producers, there's like 30. I'm like, I'm like, I'm still scrolling. I'm like, what? <laughs> Who are these people? How do they, how do they, how do they divide that? <laughs> So, Paul, you spent a few years working at Sound City before it was closed off to the public in 2011 for a period of time. Sound City, of course, is one of the most important studios in rock and roll history. What was the vibe like at the studio before it shut down? 
it was a funky place. I mean, Sound City was, you know, in an industrial complex and just kind of, you know, had the brown carpet and it was just, no matter how many times you vacuumed or wiped things off, it just didn't seem clean. And, you know, so it was, but between that console and what was going on in that drum room, what was coming out of there was world class. It wasn't posh. But, you know, people who understood what it, what that studio was all about can totally, like, take advantage of, hey, it's not as expensive as these other places around town, and it has a Neve desk that's been, you know, like, properly maintained, and, you know, hey, just wash your hands. <laughs> it was the people. Like, the people there cared. And, you know, it's like, yeah, it, it's not the fanciest studio in town, but it's like, hey, we care, we're going to go the extra mile, and we're going to, you know... I'm going to help whoever the engineer is while I was the assistant or even when I was a runner. Hey, I'm going to take your food order. I'm going to, I'm going to make sure everything's correct. I'm going to check the food when I come back. I mean, this is the whole thing of going from the runner desk to being an, an assistant engineer. You know, how can Siobhan, studio manager, trust a runner who can't get a, a food order together correctly to, you know, tr for her to trust that person going into a studio and making the right patch for whoever client comes in? It, you know, it... It's it's a lot of attention to detail. So that was kind of her vetting things out. And, you know, I got in there and, and it, it, just, it was just a fun, great place. So, you know, she was the manager and she, you know, she rallied the guys and, you know, she'd hire everybody. And, you know, obviously everyone had to work together and, you know, everyone kind of had to fit in. And uh, and she created a really cool, you know, group of guys. And it's like there's Nick Raskielenix, there's Greg Fiddleman, there's Billy Joe Bowers, uh, who Joe Barisi was in there. Like all those guys came out of Sound City, and and now I'm one of them. My other my other friend uh, who came out of there, Josh Smith, he's another guy. And then there's Miles Wilson, who actually the whole reason why there was a void to fill in the assistant engineering spot, uh, he moved on to uh, work with the Pixies, and now he's like their front of house guy, like the tours around all over the world, and you know he's just great at it. I was already freelance by this point. So, and I was working on the Evanescence record and all of a sudden I get a text from Siobhan and she's like, you know, rest in peace, Sound City. And I was like, I text her back. I'm like, what happened? And she's like, you know, they're selling off the gear. You know, so I told Nick and he, he, he you know, he talked to Dave, Dave Grohl and other friends talked to Dave Grohl and you know, next thing you know, he's buying the console because this other guy was going to buy it and just part it out. And so Dave got in there and yeah, they they were having a hard time. So, uh, you know, it's, you know, you got a big studio with staff and then you have uh, artists who are on tighter budgets that don't want to spend any money or the labels just don't have the budget. They just keep getting, cutting the budgets in half. So, uh, you know, a lot of studios around town had to figure that out. That's cool how you all rallied around it. You know, it's, it's a small community. So when, you know, when Chris Cornell passed, you know, it's like, hey, everybody feels that. It's like, he came into Sound City. It's like, we did a Rick Rubin session. And this was before Audio Slave, but Rick Rubin put, hey, I'm doing this song. I, I need to do this track for Spider-Man or whatever movie. And it was Rage Against the Machine, basically. And then Chris Cornell came in to sing the vocal. And and that was kind of the beginning of that. So uh, I remember I had to pick him up in my, I had a 63 Comet. It wasn't super tight. It was cool looking, but, you know, it was a... It was a sketchy ride because it's four wheel drum brakes and, you know, straight six, you know, engine and it wasn't fast or powerful. And it was just kind of like a, a cruiser. Uh, but I had to go pick him up and take him from, you know, Beverly Hills back into Van Nuys, you know, illustrious Van Nuys. And it was just kind of, you know, strange. You're like, you know, hey, how you doing? I'm Paul. I'm going to take you to Sound City. All right, cool. And he just looks out the window the whole time, admiring the day because it was sunny. And it was, a, you know, it was a cool car. His arm was hanging out and just looking out the window because what are you going to do when you're in a car with a stranger who you don't know well you know he sat in the front seat not the back seat so that was cool <laughs> yeah for sure well i mean chris was friends with dave are you and dave friends i mean we're acquaintances i wouldn't say we're friends but you know when he sees me he's like fig what's happening and it's always great to see him and uh you know and you know i work out as 606 too a bunch because nick partnered up with him nick raskielinix before he bought the console he had this other neve console i think it was an 80 an 8058 and it was an inline console it was it was like a version after the 8068 and i don't know why it was the 58 because the number is smaller but anyways it was a 32 channel inline desk and it was really fun and punchy and you know had lots of you know cool things and we worked out of there a bunch until you know after 2011 girl bought the sound city desk 
and swap them out. But, uh, you know, there, there's been a new version of Sound City with Kevin Agunis came in and he just took the whole place over. So everything was gone. So he just had the shell. And then he, he changed a few things. He, he, he redid the control room with, uh, like 1950s, you know, like the little tiles, the acoustic tiles with the holes in it. New tiles in the, in the drum room, which was, it needed, it needed it. Yeah. And it's kind of like remodeled the inside to just update it. And then he, and then he moved, he moved out. And then this other guy came in and brought two Helios consoles. I'd had heard some friends go in there, some other producer engineers, and they're like, I'm not digging that. And it it was just hard to get in there. Then now, uh, Blake Mills and Tony Berg are in there and they have a Neve desk or a Neve type desk. I think Avitas designed this uh, and it's supposed to be great. 24 channels of, you know, something similar to what was in there, you know, hopefully. Uh, I just haven't had a chance to get in there. Uh, Blake Mills and, and, and Tony just keep it booked. So it's supposed to be I guess it's semi-private or semi-commercial, but you know, Bob Dylan just came out of there. He did a record, you know, it's still an industrial complex. And, you know, I bring my guitars as Eric's guitar and that's right in that same complex. And Matt, Matt Wallace still has his space right across the, you know, the driveway from, from Sound City. And there's two other studios. I'm not sure exactly what's happening. One was Goodnight LA and uh, Jackie Jackson from the Jackson 5 took that over towards the end of the time I was at the studio. Uh, and then he moved in, uh, Nevada. And I only know this because my grand piano that's at my studio now was at that studio. That's so cool. So how long were you at Sound City? From 2001 to 2006. I was so lucky because uh, I started on tape and then we kind of morphed into Pro Tools pretty quick. But I still had to have tape chops because they were still locking tape machines to Pro Tools and transferring back and forth. Like nothing lived in Pro Tools 100% yet. So like, hey, I just need these 11 drum tracks transferred into Pro Tools. And then some guy picks it up on a hard drive and he comes back later on and I have to lock it back up and dump it back on tape. And it has to be phase, like the phase coherency has to like, it's got, you know, it's got to be super tight, the lock. And, you know, we listen to like the tape hi-hat and the Pro Tools hi-hat and the lock has to like, it has to sound like a tight phaser, basically. Like you have to make sure that doesn't get, if it gets too wide and slappy, then then you've dropped. And it's just, you know, it's stressful. But, uh, you know, I was lucky because that helped me understand a lot of other things. And then when HD came out in the 192s, then everyone just started living all in Pro Tools. Now bands can save on, you know, tape, one, and the time to run a tape machine. Uh, and now you're just all in tools. And that comes out, you know, on a drive. You don't have to calibrate the next Pro Tools rig. I mean, you have to make sure whatever you're hitting your console with is either minus, minus 18 or wherever you want that set. Uh, other than that, you're good to go. I mean, I don't know many bands right now. It, it, you know, it's like a, a band that says, you know, oh, you know, we're, we're going to record a tape. And it's like, well, you guys must have lots of money because tape is like 200 something a reel. And if you don't want to record any of, over any of it, then you've got to buy multiple reels. But then not only that, you've got to buy, find a decent batch of multiple reels that don't shed. That they're all part of the same batch. Even as ba far back as 2011, uh, when we were doing Evanescence, we were supposed to, we were going to record the strings to tape. So we had two reels. We got up to New York and they could not keep the lock. Like they had Simpty time code amplifiers. They had, you know, the techs were working the night before and, and, you know, they're like, oh, it'll be set up by, you know, first thing, you know, you'll be solid, you know, first thing tomorrow. And we get up there and, you know, we've got the bows are up in the air and this is like the third take and the lock keeps getting longer and longer. And finally, like the bows are up and I can hear, you know, it's like one, two, and I'm like, abort. I'm like, I don't have lock. And it's like, I've got musicians out there that need to get to, you know, Book of Mormon and Spider-Man and wherever, you know, anything on Broadway at the time. It's like, they don't have time to waste on this tape machine. So we just pulled all the patches, went straight to Pro Tools and just went ripping from there. So it was just one less thing to worry about. So, Paul, what was it like recording Amy Lee's vocals for the Evanescence record you did with Nick Raskulinitz? You know, Nick has a process for recording vocals, so I had to work on a day off. He had to, he had to, you know, take a day off. So it was just me and Amy, and, you know, basically, she sings it great the first time. She is spot on. But now I'm going for attitude or vibe and, like, an emotion. So she'll sing it. Nick's like, dude, just 
have her sing it like 10 times. But out of those 10 takes, I'm creating the double and a triple. And they're all locking together. And if you pan that stuff around, it's pretty impressive sounding. You have to have a great singer that can lock, you know, lock with themselves in pitch and time. And it just comes out like it's, it's, it's here, it's there, and it's over there. And it's pretty massive sounding. She's amazing. I mean, like, so Amy is just very honed in on music. Like she's, like she knows every note that go, that's going by. Like it's there for a reason. And, uh, and this is the thing that really impressed me with her. And this is where I like, all of a sudden I was like, wow. I studied in college and I went to uh, jazz school and, and, you know, so I had to read music and do all that stuff and jump through all these hoops. And, uh, you know, so we're in New York recording strings for the record and we had David Campbell put this ensemble together. It was like 14 piece orchestra or, you know, small. And she goes out there and she's discussing the score with him and she grabs a pencil. You have to watch out for this. And she's just putting the marks on the score as it goes, you know, and, I was like, holy smokes, she is super legit. I'm like, all right, you win. Like, you know, you're you're legit and you, you're you a great singer and, you know, you understand what's happening and uh, every step of the way. So uh, I, I, I highly respect Amy Lee. It's funny because uh, when she gets into like, you know, like adding keys, like synthesizers and keys and the MIDI stuff, she moves so fast. Like she works so fast. She's like, okay, I need this. I need that sound. I need this. And, and Nick's like, dude, you get in there. And I'm like, all right, cool. And I'm just like, boosh, 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 boosh. And it's super fun because she knows what she's going for and she's, and she's trying to get there. I don't, it's like, go, I want to record right now. So she, I feel she was doing the same thing. You know, I, it's like the way I, my analogy is, it's like music is like, you're just constantly pulling everything out of your head. It's not, it, you're not looking at all of it. It's, it's coming out like, like floss almost. And I, I just, you know, so Amy Lee is kind of doing that. That's awesome. What's she like to hang with? Oh, she's super nice and sweet and funny. <laughs> she's got Will Hunt in the band and, and Will Hunt and Nick Raskin likes. And, uh, you know, he's another Sound City guy and he's like one of the most hilarious people I've ever worked with. And it, that's why we get along so great. Truth be told, Evanescence isn't my first like go-to, yeah. I didn't truly understand the band. It was kind of off my radar, but you know, Nick's like, you know, dude, we're gonna do an Evanescence record. I'm like, all right, cool. <laughs> so you mentioned that Amy was present for the orchestral recordings for the record. In general, what was the orchestral experience like? We were supposed to, we were gonna record the strings to tape. So we had two reels, we got up to New York and they could not keep the lock. Like they had Simpty time code amplifiers. They had, you know, the techs were working the night before and, and, you know, they're like, oh, it'll be set up by, you know, first thing, you know, you'll be solid, you know, first thing tomorrow. And we get up there and, you know, we've got the bows are up in the air and this is like the third take and the lock keeps getting longer and longer. And finally, like the bows are up and I can hear, the, you know, it's like one, two, and I'm like, abort. I'm like, I don't have lock. And it's like, I've got musicians out there that need to get to, you know, Book of Mormon and Spider-Man and wherever, you know, anything on Broadway at the time. It's like, they don't have time to waste on this tape machine. So we just pulled all the patches, went straight to Pro Tools and just went ripping from there. So it was just one less thing to worry about. That's smart. So the string sessions took place in New York. Where was the rest of the record recorded? That was like 14 weeks in Nashville at Blackbird. So we were Blackbird Studio D just for 14 weeks. And I remember all the uh, other like country guys would come in. It's like, hey, what's going on in there? You know, cause those guys usually, hey, the assistant engineer sets up at eight, the band comes in at nine. They're they're done by noon of a, like the whole record, you know? So, and they use everything on the console. But Nick and I, you know, we came up with Sound City. We like to build rock records. And it's like, you build rock records with different mic pre's and compressors and different stations. Hey, that's this guitar sound and that's gonna be that guitar sound. And, you know, and we take our time, make, you know, having the artists like paint what's gonna happen on, on the record. You know, it's not just like, all right, we got the twangy thing there, we got this thing here. And, you know, and lots of respect for all those talented musicians because when it goes down, it sounds like the record, right? But they're just blown away by like, like we're dug in. We're staying here for 14 weeks until it's done. And we're going to use all this equipment every single day. <laughs> so we're in the Studio D and it's got like, it's like the world's largest API console. It's like 96 inputs. And then, uh, then you've got like all these vintage Neves, 
all these vintage APIs, vintage Helios, you name it. It's like, they've got it. And, you know, they got tons of 251s and any mic that you can think of. Hey, do you have one of those? Oh, yeah, we got one of those. And, you know, so, it, yeah, it, it was just such an amazing place to work. And, and uh, I'm lucky enough to be able to work at places like that, that, you know, working with bands that have a budget. Because nowadays it's like just getting a band that has a little bit of a budget. It's like, hey, well, I know a great place you can get all that stuff done. So, 